Ooh! Golly jeepers, man! Who's got the bad crop effect now? <laughs> I probably probably won't even do that again. I'll probably just shoot them all separately and, and fix it in editing. Ugh, what do you want? Actually, I wanted to talk to you today about Scarface. I actually thought it retained some of the main problems that I have with most mobster, gangster, what have you movies, where a lot of the progression and evolution that I want to see in the story just sort of happens off screen in the blink of an eye. For instance, when Montana comes back from Bolivia and Frank is upset at his robust initiative, he just goes, eh, I don't care if you fire me. I've got my own cocaine business. And it's like, what? When? I can't, I can't, I just can't focus. I just can't focus. It happens so suddenly and immediately takes me out of the story because a lot of the stuff that happens off screen is exactly the kind of stuff that I want to see in these types of movies. Aside from that, Al Pacino obviously smashed it out of the park. He was very enjoyable to watch and it really helped ease the three hour runtime. <laughs> I also really liked the synth-heavy music by Giorgio Moroder. I felt that it encapsulated the 80s period very well and made the film feel like an iconic piece of that era. Some of the shootouts were really cool, but aside from that, I just felt the film was okay, really. Gah, come on! Just leave me alone, man, I don't care! What? Yeah, no, no, I don't care. No one cares about your opinions, you gotta understand that, just stop bothering me. I I'm sorry, I just thought that, you know... Maybe we could do another one. It's fine if you want to do it, just don't bring me into this. Just do it on your own time. Leave me out of this. You're interrupting my Fortnite wins. It's Fortnite loses now. I think I'm gonna get cool Fortnite wins. All my friends are gonna make fun of me with this. I'm wasting more time on this than I am with you. All right, fine. I'll go. I'll get my own house. That's right. I'll get my own house. Welcome to- I'd like to talk to you today about Hot Fuzz. I mean, what else is there to say? It's an Edgar Wright film. It was fast-paced, well-written, and not to forget hilarious. As a cop drama, I wasn't greatly absorbed by it, and many of the action scenes, to me at least, felt a bit messy, what with the high-speed editing and shaky close-ups. But for those personal quibbles, the film makes up for it tenfold with the hilarious dialogue between Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, not to forget just how easily lovable Edgar Wright's visual style is. There were great payoffs to many jokes and references in the film. The extended climax was a thrilling joyride that honestly had me grinning throughout the whole thing. It's a densely packed film when it comes to its writing with much foreshadowing in the most unsuspecting places and that craftsmanship alone is worth heavy praise. Overall it was a thoroughly enjoyable film and just a wonderful cinematic escape. I'd probably give it personally a 7.5 but I think technically it should get an 8. I don't know I'm so fickle with my ratings I just I don't know we'll, we'll see what happens. It's actually really cramped in here so I'm just I'm gonna go do something else now. All right Booker we're just gonna we'll just you know place you down there right? <clears throat> I want to talk to you about, no, 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 I just want to talk to you about 12 Angry Men. Apart from being just an absolutely gripping juror drama, there were many powerful moments that transcended the words being said and made for some incredibly baller scenes that only ever increased my enjoyment of the film. A highlight for me must have been when one of the temperamental jurors is just going off, and then one by one everyone else slowly gets up and turns their backs towards him, sick of his prejudice. Moments like these carried such power behind them and beautifully paid off what was discussed and set up throughout the whole film. The film takes place mainly in one room, so a lot of the heavy lifting is incumbent on the script writing plus the performances, both of which I felt were superb. The stories that were shared, the anecdotes the jurors would tell, all of it just felt so well crafted under the veil, no not yet, all of it was crafted so well under the veil of a previously thought to be open and shut murder case. Come on, almost done. I thoroughly enjoyed this film, and I think this is one of the few on this list that I would happily watch again just to see these characters interact once more because, you know, they're just so much dang fun to spectate. Clearly she's not a fan. Oh man, that was such a heady film, but goodness gracious if I didn't love every minute of it. Also, please excuse the mess. Uh, while I was cleaning up, I happened to get stuck underneath my kitchen sink. Uh, but who cares about that when we can talk about Memento? I was incredibly impressed at how the abstract plotting of the film still had cohesion and felt relatively understandable despite the albeit confusing gimmick. And calling it a gimmick is actually kind of a rude statement because it has such relevance to the film's themes and ties in with the experience of watching the movie to create something truly mind-boggling. The whole movie was captivating and confusing and charmingly unique and memorable, which I, which I guess is kind of ironic. <laughs> The two parts of the film that were bouncing back and forth with each other felt well stitched together and overall gave the film an interesting sense of tension and suspense that helped keep me invested in the story's progression. Overall, it was just a very unique and gripping noir story and it's no wonder why it's held such relevance in pop culture. It's, it's like, it's just such a interesting, nutty film and it executes its concept so well.
Um, now, if you'll excuse me, I need to get out of here because I'm very stuck and very uncomfortable. I'll, I'll see you in the next one. I love you. Pan's Labyrinth was kind of awesome. I actually don't know where to begin. I guess I'll start with the beautiful set design, but with the World War II era cottage in the woods, and also just the stunning architecture of the labyrinth and all of the mystical stuff that was just, just wonderful, and also the incredible makeup and visual effects. I am a bit sad though that there wasn't more of the fantasy stuff, but the story that was introduced alongside these whimsical nightmares was so rich and intense and enthralling that it acts perfectly as a companion to the more visually striking elements of the film. It came to the point where as I was watching the film, I was just completely dumbfounded at what would happen next, and I was audibly rooting for certain characters and just overall expressing my enjoyment of the film vocally to myself. The actress who played Ophelia did a wonderful job, uh, same for pretty much the entire cast. Uh, special props as well to Sergi Lopez, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, but thank you for making me truly hate your character and only getting further involved in the stakes of the story. The score was beautiful and fitting, the pacing was great, this was just the most visceral viewing experience of any films that I've watched on this list. I've truly enjoyed it. I wish I could talk more about it. Oh, it's so, so, so nice. And for this one, uh, I'm going to juggle for the entirety of the minute review. Uh, so let's get going. Um, I don't know if it's solely the set designers or the uh, color palettes used or maybe a combination of many elements, but uh, it's hard to deny that David Fincher's films always know how to get across dank and dirty interior decorating. Of course, going into it, I actually knew the, the reveal going into it. Uh, as you know, it's practically a household phrase, you know, what's in the box. But that didn't stop me from getting really sucked in to the mystery at play. I like how they saved Kevin Spacey's title for the end of the film, so as to keep the killer's identity truly a secret up until it's revealed. Aside from him doing a great job, Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt uh, were wonderful on screen and worked very well together, especially with the help of the gritty noir script. There were many cinematically beautiful shots that, you know, I stuck out to me. And, and further aided my immersion into the bleak world of the film. I definitely became more engaged with the film as it went on in the second half, but overall I thought the film was just a really interesting philosophical uh, and enigmatic thriller. Uh, it was good, but gross. But very good, but gross. But very good, but very gross. Oh, God. oh hey. Oh, sorry about this. I. Uh... I get really hot feet when I sleep in the summer. It, it, does, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, uh, Terminator 2. Uh, practically everything about this film is better than the first. We got better special effects, better action, better story, better character dynamics. It's a pretty damn good sequel, though to be fair, I didn't think too much of the first one, so this one didn't have to work too hard to be better in my opinion. For the record, I watched the theatrical version, which I felt had pretty solid pacing as far as the story beats were concerned. Some of the action scenes went on for a bit too long, stretching the tension just a hair too thin, but I found myself much more enjoying the plight of the characters this time around, especially enjoying the bond between John Connor and the Terminator. Sarah Connor, I feel, was a much improved character this time around, and Linda Hamilton certainly got to flex her acting chops a lot more in this film and to great effects. Robert Patrick, who played the T-1000, uh, it was a brilliantly menacing performance, but I feel that praise is equally owned by the visual effects, which really brought his threatening character to life. Overall, I was pleasantly impressed by the caliber of quality that this film brought, and I would happily watch this one over the first any day of the week. And I don't know uh, how to end this segment. I guess I'm just going to get out of the fridge. <laughs> and just go about my day. With Schindler's List, it felt like I was watching more of a documentary of sorts, recreating scenes of horror and torment that were perfectly acted by all of the extras who performed in them. Some scenes towards the end of this three-hour film did feel slightly obtrusive to the flow of the plot, even though in retrospect I completely understand why they exist and what they were trying to show me. For instance, the scene where the train of women are redirected to the gas chambers was horrifying and disturbing on many accounts, and I can tell that's what they wanted to convey, but it felt they didn't find a great place to fit it in narratively, so it ends up interrupting the engaging flow of the plot. But speaking of terrifying scenes, the 15-minute liquidation scene was morbidly the most enthralling part of the movie to me. I think Liam Neeson did a great job, but I can't neglect my boy Ray Fiennes, who ends up headlining some of my favorite scenes in the film, like the stubborn gun scene, and later when he's just picking off his workers one by one from his balcony. Spielberg's techniques as a filmmaker were largely noticed closer to the beginning of the film, and those helped seamlessly transition me into the world of the film and better digest what it wanted to show me. It was a well-made film on many accounts. It was truly distinct from a cinematic experience you might usually expect. It was disturbing and uncomfortable and terrifying, but it was expertly made and crafted. Um, I look forward to never watching it again. 
<laughs> Casablanca, I have no doubt, is possibly the most classic a film on this list could be. And even with that proposal, I don't have that much to say about it. I found it to be quite a tragic yet endearing love story, and most of all I enjoyed the lively saloon where the majority of the film takes place. It painted such an interesting picture, filled with vignettes, to make it and the town of Casablanca feel so active and boisterous. And Humphrey Bogart, of course, is just so damn smooth that it's hard not to catch some of his inflections and cadences after watching his performance. And of course, who could forget the main star of the film, Samuel, my boy with the, oh, those keyboard fingers. I'm quite a sucker for piano being played in films, and this movie was no exception to that rule. And I think what I enjoyed most about this film was the personality of Casablanca, and it felt really nice to sort of lose myself in the world for a bit, even if I don't feel too strongly about the movie as a whole. You know, perhaps I don't share the same reverence to Casablanca as perhaps some cinema lovers and film critics might, but but I still enjoyed peeking into that world and I found it to be quite a cozy watch. Now if you'll excuse me, I'll play us out. Yeah, I don't know how to play piano. Uh oh, here comes Jackson with another controversial opinion. Uh, Raging Bull was just kinda eh. I mean, Robert De Niro obviously was fantastic in the lead role, and who could forget the main attraction of the film being the editing, with the fast pace and flashy boxing sequences showing it off the best. And although the fighting scenes were intense and exciting, I didn't feel like they brought much to the story, other than to just break up the other scenes of the film. Uh, but otherwise, it was pretty good. I can appreciate the editing, it's just I can't really admire it with the same awe that people in the 80s must have when they first saw it. The sound design was also pretty impactful, especially during the fighting scenes, you know, both inside and outside the ring. I couldn't tell if there was exactly animal sounds that was being played in the background, but nevertheless, I really thought it brought together the Raging Bull moniker in our main character. The plot as well was just sort of boring to me. I feel like it's the kind of story that Scorsese has done better in many of his later films, but in this one, this iteration just kind of didn't strike me all that much. The dialogue as well could be quite tedious, especially between Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci's characters. There's a lot of like, oh, forget about it. What's this? What's that? Just, it was just kind of, just kind of tedious. And overall, it was a fine film. I liked it all the same. It's just that it didn't really spark enough in me to really start loving it. Yeah, I, I did not vacuum nearly enough of this floor. I really did a bad job. Okay, well, I mean, it's here. Might as well, you know, see if we can give it a shot, I guess. Uh... With spine. With sp with Spinal Tap, it's really fascinating to me how much influence this film has in pop culture. For example, I didn't even know up until now that the phrase turn it up to 11 was actually coined by this film. Also, this movie essentially kicked off a new genre of films, that being mockumentaries. So on those efforts, I can appreciate this film and can acknowledge at least somewhat how influential it was. On to the film itself, I thought it was a pretty cute, simple flick. I think a standout would be the original music played in the film, actually written by the actors themselves, which is pretty neat. I found out that the majority of the film was improvised, with the actors mostly having loose plot points to follow, but otherwise were free to improv their way through the scenes. Because of this, I felt the dialogue was a bit muddled and wandering at times, leading to a less focused experience with certain scenes meandering without much ground to stand on. There's humorous moments and bits of dialogue that had me chuckling, but the film is otherwise pretty simple and is fine for what it set out to be. 6 out of 10. Maybe it's not for me. God, I'm hungry, y'all. Get it? Because because it's like the Breakfast Club. This movie was so boring. I can see why it remains so iconic, considering the main five characters of the film represent such distinct archetypes, which fundamentally makes it interesting to put them all in a room together. However, even though I enjoyed when their more interesting and complex backstories were explored later in the film, I just didn't like almost all of the characters in this movie. Like the tough guy. I just hated him, and I felt like he never really evolved beyond that point. Like, yeah, we heard some of his sympathetic backstory, but I felt no sympathy, and I didn't really feel like he changed at all by the end of the film. The film as well can feel quite disjointed at times, like when they break out into a dance montage right after they get into a heated argument and when they're comedically running through the halls. This can be emblematic of how quintessential an 80s flick this is, but it only further disconnected me from the film. I can appreciate the writing, though, of the teenagers. Their characteristics felt quite timeless, and the mixing and matching of pairs felt natural and well-structured. I was just bored through most of it, the characters didn't help, and I successfully deduced that this film is not for me.
The true awe of this film is getting to see John Hurt become John Merrick and observe his and Anthony Hopkins' character interact and get along. The prosthetics do a lot of the heavy lifting, but with John Hurt's incredible attention to his cadence and his movements truly bring the character all of the life that it needs. It was a very emotional film, and while mostly depressing, there were moments where the score, coupled with the dialogue, made for some very touching moments as well. For being made pretty much after Eraserhead, there are some moments here that feel like leftovers from that film's visual style that just don't match with the more down-to-earth tone that the rest of the film presents. However, David Lynch's signature sound design delightfully haunts those moments and brings an ominous atmosphere that feels thematically appropriate to the more grounded elements. This movie definitely left me feeling emotionally pensive after watching it, and I feel the effectiveness of the more depressing moments and the more heartfelt moments bonded together to create something that I just consider to be a very beautiful piece of art. Holy crap! What a finale. When the boat is shifting, being pulled by the sheer mass of the shark, it looked incredible. And I can't stress enough how well this film maintains its suspense and excitement with its practical effects. John Williams' score was beautiful, but also dreadful and wonderfully orchestrated the scenes in Chase of the Shark. Uh, the characters were well acted, and the comedic banter that they had was just the cherry on top. The close encounters with the shark were actually incredible, and the practical effects not that dated, especially for being made so long ago. 46 years ago, this film was made and it is still incredibly tense, nerve-wracking, and just wonderfully exciting. I also adored the scene with Brody's kid mimicking his actions and also the uh, injury contest scene that happens later in the film. They were brilliant moments that added lovely dashes of character into the mix that I just loved to see. Overall, I was pleasantly surprised with this film. It was marvelous on many accounts and definitely succeeded in making me uh, very terrified of sharks. All right, let's get this over and done with. You know it's coming, you know what I'm about to say. I absolutely hated The Godfather Part 3. <laughs> In the last installment of this series, I reviewed the first two Godfather films to less than stellar acclaim, and so I thought in this one, why not cap off the trilogy, and oh yeah, well, well, wouldn't you know it, uh, I didn't like it. <laughs> Sofia Coppola wasn't as bad as I was expecting her to be, she was really just reading her lines poorly, there wasn't a whole lot of acting going on, and it... Look, I'll be real with you, I don't have a whole lot to say about this film. This film was not an enjoyable experience. This film was an excruciating countdown. These films took nine hours of my life in total, and I just, I'm never getting those back. I, and I just, I hate that I spent so much time on these movies and was just completely bored by all of them. It's really tough to be objective about this because the films are fine, the acting is fine, the cinematography is fine, the plot is eh, but I just personally was so bored by it and bored by all of the films in general that I just can't bring myself to say many positive things about it. It just took nine hours of my life and I just, I, I can't forgive boring. But on a lighter note, the first section of Full Metal Jacket acts as a wonderful standalone short film where Vincent D'Onofrio obviously kills it. Well, that's a, that's a poor choice of words. My hair is getting in my eyes. But it also sucked me in with Kubrick's long takes and just beautiful picture-perfect moments sprinkled throughout. And also, who could forget the real star of this section, R. Lee Ermey as the drill instructor. Holy crap, guys. There's nothing I can really say about his performance that can't be understood by just, as a bird. There's nothing I can really say about his performance that can't be understood by just watching him on screen for every second he appears. The second part of the film waned a bit for me in the beginning, but the disjointed scenes found focus by the end with a fantastic climax complete with just incredible scenery. Practically every frame introduced something new to gawk at, whether it was to appreciate the filmmaking or to put into perspective the events of the Vietnam War. And the score was ominous and haunting, and though minimally used, was very effective in the scenes where it comes in. Overall, I think this film speaks more visually than it does with its dialogue, but with Kubrick at the helm, it is just a beautiful display for the eyes, and more so a brilliant attempt to illustrate the expanse of war on film. Now stop me if you've heard this one before, but I actually knew the ending of this film before going into it, but with less visual association to that knowledge, so I was able to experience it more as a first-time viewer than others on this list. And it was a fine film. I very much appreciated how, even with knowing the iconic twist of the film, it still presented it as this catalyst for an emotional love story that helped to strengthen the overall narrative. Also, with knowing the ending beforehand, I have to admire the craftsmanship of limiting Willis's interactions with those around him and maintaining a good flow of dialogue without ruining the subtlety of what's being shown. The acting, however, uh, was a bit less stellar in the main character. I thought that Bruce Willis uh, was a bit too stoic, and I couldn't help but think about who could have played that role better. Haley Joel Osment, for being 
you know, Eleven did a pretty good job, and Tony Colletti was a complete surprise to see in the cast, but I mean, of course, she did a pretty good job as well. And aside from those elements, I didn't really love the film all that much. It was well made, and there were intriguing moments, many of which surfaced in the last half hour of the film, but as a whole, it wasn't enough to grab me as much as I hoped it would have. Now back to sleep. Ring, 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 ring. No, I just, just, just kidding. Uh, it's me. Like a precarious stack of books, I'm relatively harmless. And although I liked a lot of the cool scenes in this film, like you know the famous shower scene, uh, Psycho was just a bit too dull for my interests. The score was incredible, and when it kicks in, it kicks hard, and it's just so catchy and off-putting and startling that it really accentuates the tension of the scenes that it's placed in. Anthony Perkins as Norman Bates just feels irreplaceable as he brings such a shy charisma to the role, as well as this weird, subtle, threatening undertone that just makes his character so off-putting. I also liked how methodical the actions of Janet Lee's character were in her attempts to escape her old life. I honestly wish that we got more of that story than what was given to us in the film. Knowing too much about this film kind of deflates what makes it so magical to begin with, and for me, even though I can sort of acknowledge a lot of interesting filmmaking tricks and stuff in the script, it just isn't as capturing to me as I wish it would have been, and unfortunately knowing that much about the movie going into it kind of spoiled the experience a bit. You know what I just realized? We've never actually just sat down and watched a movie for one of these things. So, you know, without further ado, let's just see what we can stir up. Oh! Well, that was a film, The Matrix. There are two distinct elements that I can divide this film up into. There's the concept, that being of The Matrix, that offers a pretty interesting mind-bending idea that makes for a fairly intriguing sci-fi story. Then there's the action, which at times can be laughably over the top, paired with effects that range from dated to still pretty solid. Now, I'm not much of an action guy, so when sets are being torn apart in front of my very eyes, aside from the eye candy, I'm just not that invested in what's happening on screen. It's mainly the concept where I find most of my enjoyment in the film, mainly because it's just fun to think about the lore of the world and how much deeper it goes past what's being shown to us in this first installment. There are, of course, a lot of cheesy lines delivered throughout this thing, and some of the action moments, perhaps because they wanted it to look more realistic and practical, just look like people being tugged around a room by a wired vest. And there are also those humorously intense sound effects for punches, which just adds to the cheesiness of the whole thing. To sum it up, I thought it was good, but for me, it never graduated from being more than a conceptually intriguing popcorn movie with fun action scenes and H.R. Giger inspired set pieces. All right, what do you got? What's the last one? Come on, we got one more. Let's let's finish this out. Oh, um, Goodwill Hunting. Ooh, good pick. I like Goodwill Hunting. I think what made it personally enjoyable would have been the writing paired with the performances. Yeah, I was surprised to see Ben Affleck and Matt Damon's names under the writing credits, but not only was I given a good script with a good story, but also enthralling characters with equally insightful dialogue. Robin Williams is obviously a national treasure, and in that film he got to shine with a much more dramatic role, and him and Matt Damon I think had a great rapport together, and the film really earns their more intimate scenes together. While the movie was going on, I kept thinking about how well structured the scenes and the story were. Every scene felt useful and flawless matched with the next. You know, a two hour film is nothing new, but with the humorous and engaging dialogue guided by the ever evolving story, it felt like a very healthily dense two hours, and I just, I loved every minute of it. I mean, overall, I thought it was a very endearing and emotional film, and one that I feel warranted Ben Affleck and Matt Damon that Oscar they got for best screenwriting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, hey, I'm sorry about earlier. Oh, don't worry about it, it's fine. No, you know, I was just, I was thinking, and it's like, you know, whatever makes you happy, you know, follow that passion, you know, don't, don't, don't listen to the voice in your head that's just like, this is a bad idea. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, it's probably going to be a while before I do another one, just because this was a lot of work and was very stressful and depressing and uh, arguably had poor planning. Well, so be it. But you enjoyed it? Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess I did. Cool. Okay. <sighs> All right. Hopefully that was good. And look at that, we finished the video. Thank you so much for watching this episode of 20 Movies in 20 Minutes. I mean, technically that's true. <laughs> but sincerely, thank you so, so, so much for watching. And I wanna give a special so, so, so thank you for watching. And I can't believe I'm, I'm, I'm doing this uh, to Carlos and Luke, my beautiful patrons for supporting me on Patreon. Uh, it, I, I can't fathom this but I am so incredibly humbled and thankful and appreciative of you guys. Uh, if you in the audience would like to support me on Patreon, there'll be a link in the description, probably at the end of this video as well. And uh, along with this video, there's probably gonna be the first piece of exclusive Patreon content uh, where there's gonna be, it's like an little outtakes thing. There were quite a few little goofs and gags while I was filming this. And so that's gonna be trimmed into a little video that will only be available on Patreon. So, hey, that's, I, be I believe Marketing 101 would call that uh, incentive. <laughs> And don't fret, we will be back to our regularly scheduled program in the next video. But for now, thank you so much for watching again. Stay hydrated, stay cool. Uh, that's the video.